This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Today's podcast is also brought to you by The Athletic. Premium coverage for passionate Detroit sports fans. Listeners can get 20% off the first year of an annual subscription by visiting theathletic.com slash DSP. Not a white-collar team. Next on Michigan Podcast. There's going to be one team that's going to play solely as a team. No man is more important than the team. No coach is more important than the team. The team, the team, the team. <laughs> In the pocket and a sack. Tim Jamison. Brady gets terrific. Throws it and a touchdown night again. Schultz just before Brazil got him. And a leaping interception by Watson. Harbaugh back to throw over the middle. But Jamie Morris packs a wallop, and he delivers for Bo Schindler. And here's your first play. Question. Sack. It is Glenn Steele, number 81, who fought his way through the traffic. Option. And Robinson calls his own number, and he's going to score. Oh, an easy touchdown for Robinson and Michigan. championship again because we're going to play as a team and when we play as a team and the old season is over you and I know it's going to be missing it again Greetings, Go Blue. Welcome to this week's episode of Michigan Podcast, a a basketball-centric episode talking about the Wolverines. We'll take a look at where things stand. We are less than nine weeks now to Selection Sunday, and when you consider a lot of us, myself included, are just now turning our attention to college basketball full-time The season is already in full swing. We're into the second half of the season, in fact. We'll be talking about that, where Michigan and the Big Ten teams stand, both in Ken Palm's ratings and the RPI, and we'll have a tribute to the late, great Keith Jackson and his unique connection to our beloved Maize and Blue, the man that, in fact, gave the Big House its name. That and more coming up on this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. Thank you for joining us. I'm Steve Dace, but we begin reliving a glorious victory in East Lansing over the weekend. By Langford, gets inside the kick, Simpson, deep J, and it's... How about the patience? They say he is not a good passer, but he can shoot. How about this? Nick Ward, recognize the double team was coming from the weak side. Wagner with 13 to shoot, turns, gets to the rim. Take that! Michigan State. Abdul Rahman gets to the bucket. The teardrop goes down. The possession alive for Michigan State. Wins it on the screen. Rises. And pure. Passes Winston with nine. Bridges. And he just throws it away. Nicely done by Xavier Simpson. And he'll find a cutting levers for a two-hand tomahawk jam. 48-47. 48-47. Wagner playing with three fouls. Inside, pump fake. Left hand counted on the foul as he just abused Nick Ward. 51-49. Abdul Rahman high off the glass and in plus the foul. Posted. Baseline, lefty flick, in and out. And right there for the follow is Langford. Spartans back on top. Simpson the kick. 
Wagner, big fella knocking down shots. He has 19, the biggest lead by either team, five points. Simpson, seven to shoot. Oh, a beautiful finger roll as he gets to the bucket on Winston. Bridges, drives, posts, leaves, and good. Wagner wants it. He's got Ward on him. Tries to rake it through. Step back. Pogo stick. Jay goes down. Dirk Nowitzki would be proud of his countrymen. Mm. 3-12 to go. Wagner behind the back. Down the lane. Ankle breaker. Whoa. 25 for Wagner. Knowing that he has the ability to get by Nick Ward off the dribble. Now Matthew slicing to the hole and pounds it down. Wow. The Michigan Wolverines come into East Lansing and record a huge victory over the number four team in America. The final score. Almost one year ago exactly, Michigan played a game at Illinois, an ugly effort, and frankly, they got punked. And afterwards, a marginal player for the University of Illinois referred to Michigan as a, quote, white-collar team. And that really stung the Wolverines because what he was saying, in a nice way, is Michigan is soft. Well, what we've seen from this team since then, the way they rebounded last year when many of us, myself included, last January had kind of given up on the season. And the way the team overcame a literal near-death experience to magically win four games in four days for their first Big Ten tournament title since the very first Big Ten tournament in 1998, and then a magical run all the way to the Sweet 16, including some karmic revenge against the cheater at Louisville, Rick Pitino, and knocking his team out of the NCAA tournament after he cheated to beat us to the national championship in 2013. And now this team this year, after a little wobbly early on, gut-wrenching loss to LSU, a game we had no business losing early on. We had a nice lead. And essentially, they just took it from us down the stretch. A game on the road at defending national champion North Carolina, where we were outclassed pretty much the whole way. Other than that, though, the way this team has won games, they've won it with slugfest, like at Texas. They've won it high-scoring affairs. They've won it with defense, like they did against Sparty. They've won it by shooting the lights out. Eight straight scoring possessions, ending with a three-point shot. The other night against Maryland in that great comeback win down by 14 in the first half. This has been a team that has now been inventing ways to lose. A resourceful team. A team that is no longer a white-collar team. John Beeline has reinvented himself at Michigan again. I, I know I know. we still hear the John Beeline, never been an assistant coach, 1-3-1 zone references every Michigan game on television. We don't play that 1-3-1 zone anymore when we were started recruiting NBA point guards like Darius Morris and Manny Harris and Trey Burke. He uh, essentially amended his Princeton-like offense to take advantage of the playmakers he had on the perimeter. We saw that flourish when we had the backcourt of Trey Burke and Tim Hardaway Jr., for example. And now Michigan, lo and behold, defensive toughness, one of the top 20 defensive efficiencies in the country. Statistically, this is by far the best defensive team John Beeline has had at Michigan. You look at the the freshmen that have been revelations. Jordan Poole essentially won the Maryland game for Michigan. He came in off the bench, a Michigan team, after a quick turnaround against an in-state rival in an emotional game that just didn't have its sea legs, had a bit of jet lag. He had fresh legs. He shot Michigan back into that lead that helped propel Michigan ultimately to a thrilling victory against a very scrappy Maryland team on Monday night. You look at what Isaiah Livers has done, first coming off the bench and then setting the defensive tone now as a starter. John Teske, he's pesky. John Teske even finished at the rim against Maryland. That's something we've not seen a lot of, as he still needs to get a little bit stronger. But Everybody has a role. It's a deep, resourceful team. It's a tough team. It is no longer a white-collar team. And you can tell by the way they ripped the still-beating heart out of Sparty's chest in their own gym on Saturday. If you're not yet a Patreon supporter for Michigan Podcast, take a look at what you missed immediately following Michigan's huge win over Michigan State. We had an instant reaction podcast for our supporters, breaking it all down right there at patreon.com slash Michigan podcast. And again, we want to thank all of you who helped to cover 
uh, some of the costs, the overhead it takes to produce uh, this really for YouTube anyway, a high level production, the graphics and everything else. You know, as my old college roommate, Mike Bartram used to say, romance without finance, a damn nuisance, right? So, I mean, someone had to pay for all the equipment and someone had to supply the mediocre talent that you are watching right now. So thank you to those of you on our Patreon page that are contributing to help make this possible. And you too can contribute as well and get extra special content exclusively for you by being one of our Patreon supporters. This was my favorite piece of post-game analysis after Michigan's a thrilling victory over Maryland at Chrysler Arena last night. This is Marr before the first free throw and before the second Stone cold, so stone cold, he looked like he was going to fall asleep. (laughs) I just love this photo. So let's talk about what the last few games for Michigan basketball means going forward in this uh, Michigan basketball-centric episode of Michigan Podcast with our good friend Michael Spath from WTKA in Ann Arbor and the Michigan Insider. Good to talk to you again, Michael. How are you? I'm doing great, Steve. And you know they say they say that about assassins, right? Like if you're gonna if you're a sniper and you got to pull that trigger, I mean you have to be completely devoid of emotion and just like just be breathing, your heartbeat like very normal, very slow. And that's what Muhammad Ali Abdul Rockman looked like before those two free throws yesterday. Michigan pulling off that throw. First of all, the that play. First of all, the throw by Isaiah Livers. Michael, is that the best forward pass anybody's made in a Michigan uniform this uh, entire academic year, do you think, or not? Well, in this entire academic year, in uh, certainly in, in 2018, yes, uh, by far. It, you know what? It, it's, it's incredible to me. Isaiah Lay, uh, Livers giveth and taketh away within a span of, what, 15 seconds? Right. I mean, he's the guy that, that was trying to switch with Charles Matthews. Charles Matthews is screaming at him to switch off his man and go out there and guard, uh, you know, the the three-point shooter from Maryland. Doesn't do it. The kid hits a three-pointer, and all of a sudden you're thinking, my God, this game, we're going to lose. Everything everything that happened with Michigan State is now squandered. Uh, And then, sure enough, he makes that great baseball pass inbounds to Muhammad Ali Abdul Rahman to save the game. And uh, that's the beauty of freshmen, right, is the the up and down, the yin and yang – of uh, how they deliver for you. He even went to a two g- tongue of Vialoa there by looking off the safety, right? He looks off Cowan, the point guard, gets Cowan to jump on the on the first guy to open up the throw uh, to Mar and, and delivers a dime right there. Uh, you know what? Maybe we need a fourth quarterback in the race, but we can be bitter about football and where it's at another podcast. We'll leave that uh, for another week, Michael. But that win last night, it was a little bit like karma finally stepped in and said the universe – you guys, we can't do this to you again. All right, you guys have been through enough. All right, I mean, you got guys like Dace in Iowa who's cutting himself. You got know, Spath is banging his head on the table, the Formica there at WTKA. People are calling in. We can't do this. You guys, we're going to do you a solid right here. Did you kind of get that feeling when that happened last night? I really did because I'll tell you what, a week earlier, I was at uh, the Michigan-Purdue game. I sat in the crowd with Ira. Uh, Weintraub and his, and his mom and my brother came with me and uh, to watch the Purdue game unfold and the opportunity for that for Michigan to win, have a, a gigantic victory on their home court and see it dissolve in the last two minutes and see uh, the officiating go against them and all the things that happened and my brother like throwing his his little glow stick down and I thought to myself like God like you know we just need a win as Michigan fans we need something to hang our hat on after a brutal football season. Uh, and so certainly it began on Saturday with the win over Michigan State. Um, and then yeah, last night, you know, Monday night, uh, to see them come back from a pretty awful first half, I mean, really the most awful first half you can imagine, see them come back and be in a position and then how everything unfolded. Yeah, I thought I thought the gods, when there were three and a half seconds left, my brother actually texted me and said, I cannot believe we're going to lose this game. And I wrote him back and I said, God owes us. The basketball gods owe us this one. <laughs> and he put, L- he put, you know, LOL, but I don't think he really believed that. And then sure enough, sure enough, the basketball gods gave us one. Let's go back to what happened on Saturday in East Lansing. And I opened up this week's episode by going back almost exactly one year ago to the day when a marginal player at the University of Illinois who lit us up in the paint in Champaign labeled us a, quote, white-collar team. And how much that stung uh, Michigan fans and the program and and really how they use that for fuel 
um, for the rest of that season to rebound. And then, you know, the, you had the near-death experience uh, before the Big Ten tournament and, and how that kind of galvanized the team from there. And, and we have seen a, another extra layer of toughness that we don't typically see early in seasons from John Beeline teams. I go back to the way they were able to grind out that win on the road against a, a long, tall, tough Texas team, for example. The diverse ways they've been able to win basketball games. Once and for all, that identity, did they squash that at the Breslin Center in front of the country on Saturday? I really think they did. You know, I, I think toughness is something that we as fans and media talk about. But I was having this debate on, you know, on Tuesday and earlier today with uh, Sean Windsor, columnist from the Detroit Free Press, because he said that, you know, players always bristle at this idea uh, when fans bring up toughness. But you know who else brings up toughness? Coaches bring mm-hmm. up toughness. Coaches talk about Beeline, Beeline uses Beeline the word grit, game. right? That's his word. Grit. That's exactly. what he says. Yeah. Exactly. So it's it's relative. It's relative, right? I mean, like not no none of us, none of us are as tough as a college athlete, especially in football or basketball, with the pressure. None of us are saying that, but it's relative to when you're playing Michigan State. Do they out physical you? Do you, uh, you know, can you match up to them when the adversity hits? And Michigan did that time and time again. I was really impressed that every time uh, Michigan State seemed to, you know, get a body blow, Michigan responded with an uppercut. And in that high ah. environment, in that in front of that crowd. Uh, Michigan really never backed down from uh, from the Spartans. And I think when you look at the players on this team, Muhammad Ali Abdul Rahman and Moritz Wagner uh, and Isaiah Livers, uh, you've got a lot of guys that are just kind of uh, street ballers a little bit. I mean, that uh, that know what it's like to, you know, they weren't the highest rated kids coming out of high school, and they're used to kind of being maybe overlooked, underestimated, and they just go out there and play – and it's almost, Steve, it reminds me, John Beeline at Michigan reminds me of Mark D'Antonio in football at Michigan State. Hmm. He gets a lot of guys that get, that get looked, you know, that get passed over by bigger schools, and he has a system in place. He is a phenomenal developer of talent, um, especially at the point guard spot, and he gets the very most out of his teams, and that's what D'Antonio does at Michigan State. And I'm really, really fortunate. We're really fortunate. We're really grateful uh, that we have John Beeline, and I consistently say over and over again, I'm sorry I ever doubted you. Mo Wagner, is that one of the all-time break-your-ankles moments? Will we be seeing that clip as Michigan fans the rest of our lives, how he depanted literally Nick Ward in his own gym? I think we'll see it if Michigan goes on and does something special this year, if they win a Big Ten title, uh, if they make it to like the Elite Eight or the Final Four. Um, I certainly hope we see it as much as we've seen that stupid clip from the Outback Bowl of years ago. See, I was going to use that Jadavion comparison. Clowney is this our Jadavion Clowney moment and how much he embarrassed Nick Ward on that play? God, I hope so. God, I hope so. And I tell you what, Steve, as a Michigan fan and as a commentator on Michigan athletics, I have to say that since Saturday, I have so thoroughly enjoyed my life <laughs> as it compares <laughs> relative to Michigan State. You know, my fiance is a Spartan. My future father-in-law is a Spartan. My sister-in-law is a Spartan. We went to a we went to a uh, birthday party on Saturday night. No one said a peep to me. No one said anything to me. Nice. But normally they're talking a little trash. I listened to sports talk radio this week. I've been on social media. Every single Michigan State person is just uh, you know bent over, just ready to like take it, and is is acting like the world has come to an end. That Michigan punked them. And the only, the only bittersweet part of it to me, Steve, is that I really think this is the way that it should be in football right now. Um, but I'll take it. I'll take it in basketball. And I'm so glad all the talk before the game about how they only played them one time all year and how unfair it was. And now how many people are so satisfied that they only play them one time this year because you're going to have bragging rights on their home court for the next 365 days. I know you're a student of the game, Michael. We get a lot of uh, comments on every one of our episodes from fans of other schools, particularly fans of schools we just finished playing. So uh, it's just a couple of serious thoughts on, on what we saw from Michigan State basketball compared to Purdue because we got a chance to see what everybody thought were the top two teams in the league playing us at our best in back-to-back games. So I think we got a good assessment of the two teams. And when I look at them, I mean, listen, if we were drafting a team at a rec league, 
we're drafting m- most of Sparty's guys. But if we're putting a college basketball team together, yeah. you look at you know Isaac Haas as a far more developed floor game than any big man Michigan State has. Michigan State's got waves of guys, but really the only back-to-the-basket player they have who's a threat is Nick Ward. But if you hard double him, he is a terrible passer out of the out of the post, which creates turnovers. We saw that when we played them on Saturday. They lack shooters. You know, Purdue to me is a more skilled version of Michigan. We're at the way they space the floor, they get a good shot every possession if they want. It's just a matter of whether it goes in or not. Michigan State, if you slow down their transition game and make them pass the ball more than once, their, their, their best play, Michael, is to throw the ball in the glass and try to attack the offensive rim because they can't get shots out of the flow. I, I think Beeline adjusted offensively in the second half. He just essentially said, we're going to take the weak side shot blockers out of, the, out of play for Michigan State. We're running isos on the wing and attacking them off the dribble. And even though we missed a lot of those layups, we got to the free throw line a lot and made a lot of those free throws to overcome a poor shooting percentage. I, 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 think, I think they've got to deal with, some, with their perimeter defense. They've got to find a, a post game uh, for Jaron Jackson because I think he's a much better all-around player than Nick Ward. They, they need the offense, I think, to run through him more than Nick Ward. And I think they need Javon Lankford to, to be the, you know, what Jordan Poole was for Michigan against Maryland somebody that can take some of the pressure off Miles Bridges because for all of the big time recruits they have they're essentially asking him to be a poor man's Magic Johnson right now and they really need him to be a scorer but they need him to do do pretty much everything else so I see a team with a lot of great talent but not a lot of defined roles and when I look at Purdue I see a team with everybody's roles are very much defined what are your thoughts? You know, you, you, you're spot on. And I, I tell you what, I, I think what, when I look at Michigan State, and I think, you, you know, you're, we're, we're pretty much just using different language to say the same thing. But I see five players on the court. I have, in the last two years, I've never seen a team on the court. Mm. Um, you know, Miles Bridges and Cassius Winston and now Jaron Jackson Jr. and Nick Ward. You've got five guys that are all phenomenal basketball players that if we're being honest, if we're being honest about Michigan basketball versus Michigan State, because I thought about this the other day, I don't think there's any single player on Michigan that in their starting lineup would start over any single player at Michigan State. All five of their guys are on paper and in terms of skill more talented than Michigan, but all five of those guys seem to play independently of each other. Mm -hmm. There's nobody, there's no galvanizing force in the middle of that Michigan State offense or that Michigan State team that we've seen in the past, whether it was Gary Harris uh, or um, uh, Payne, uh, I can't remember. It was Adrian Payne. Adrian his Payne. First name. Yep. Um, yeah, and you had Draymond Green, and you had uh, guys in the past. Even like when they were, you know, their 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 you know their zenith when they won the national championship. Mo Peterson and Mateen Cleaves and Antonio Smith were all guys that made everybody around them better. Right now, there's nobody that does that. And right now, when you've got on Michigan, you've got a lot of guys that are playing together as a team. We spent the whole first half season uh steve talking about who is going to be the man who's going to be the go-to guy and what we've figured out finally the last like four or five six games is michigan doesn't need a go-to guy right. at least not yet it needs a go-to guy because everybody can be the go-to guy they're so much better of a team and you're spot on i think of the same thing with purdue when i look at them carson edwards it was phenomenal in that game uh his ability to hit the three his way to push you know put pressure on the point guards for Michigan, the guy that I think was that just stole the show against Michigan and that I would love to have on my team is Dakota Mathis. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he was, he had to have had, I don't know what he had, like maybe 18, 21 points and probably five or six three pointers coming off the edge. He plays hard, he plays gritty, that we, word we used earlier. He is that glue player, but he's so much more than that because a lot of times you think of glue players as guys that average, you know, six points and, and seven rebounds and they're just. He can shoot the basketball lights out, too. I really like him. Isaac Haas, his back-to-the-basket game has come along so far in a, a year, but really in the last two years. I mean, two years ago, you didn't even have to guard this guy in the post. And he kind of maybe got a couple of putbacks here and there, some dunks. But now he's got a really good low-post game. No, I really like Purdue. I think they're going to give uh, – I think they're going to be – they are the best team in the Big Ten – But I tell you what, I don't think Michigan or Ohio State is too far behind. Um, And I honestly right now think Michigan State is the fourth best team in the Big Ten. When I look fast forward to March, and this will be the last chance we get to talk to you for a few weeks because you're heading off to warmer climate. 
uh, to get married uh, to uh, your little Sparty over there that you were just talking about. But but as we fast forward to March, we're less than nine weeks now to Selection Sunday. When I start looking at NCAA tournament brackets, I look for two things. I look for teams that can beat, can play a slow game and a fast game because you play varying styles with quick turnarounds in the tournament. And then I look for teams that can put three guys on the floor at any given time who can get their own offense when things break down and you have to create on your own. When I look at Michigan State right now, I don't see three guys for all of their big-time recruits. I don't see a lineup where they can put three guys on the court where they can create their own offense. I think Michigan can put a lineup on the floor at any given time where five guys can create their own offense. So what do you think that means for the Wolverines as we fast forward to March, Michael? I'm really high on their potential. And, you know, and you make a great point. Uh, I think the thing that really excites me, too, is that John Beeline, people have said this year after year after year, that John Beeline teams are so hard to scout for, especially when you have a quick turnaround. So if he can get past that first-round game, he always sets himself up to win the second-round game. Last year, with an amazing run and really a heroic performance from Derek Walton, Michigan won the Big Ten tournament and got to the Sweet 16. This team is better than that team. I truly believe that. They've got more pieces that they can really utilize. Uh, they don't have quite the good, as, you know, as good a point guard play, obviously, as a year ago. But everywhere else on the floor, including their depth, is better than last year's team. I, would, I honestly think, depending on the seeding, depending on the matchup, and beating Michigan State and beating Maryland is so much more your seeding um, in the NCAA tournament. If they can find a way to beat Purdue on the road, uh, they really put themselves in a position where they should be a top-four seed uh, in the NCAA tournament. I think Sweet 16 is the, you know, is the, is, the, is the bare minimum of this team's potential. After that, Steve, I really have a hard time ever saying, well, a team's a disappointment if they don't win the national championship. A team's a disappointment if they don't win the Final Four. Because March Madness is such a different mm-hmm. animal than anything else out there that for you to say if a team doesn't get to the Elite Eight or doesn't get to the Final Four, they're a bust. Because you have no idea what the matches are going to be. You have no idea where they're going to be sent to. You have no idea like, what the motions are going to be. You have no idea what the injuries are going to be. All those things. I would say that most of the time when you're at Duke or North Carolina or Kansas or Kentucky, everybody should circle the second weekend. You get to the Sweet 16 and you've done something with your season. And then it's really about like how does it work out. But that's for me for Michigan. I think they have the potential to be a Final Four team. I really, truly do from everything I've seen this year. But after the Sweet 16 – anybody's guess at that point. Michael Spad, WTKA in Ann Arbor and the Michigan Insider. Again, uh, congratulations on the wedding. We'll talk to you again in February, brother. God bless, okay? All right. Thank you so much, Steve. I really appreciate it. All right. We'll come back. More Michigan podcast in a moment. There's a look at The Athletic, our partners here on Michigan Podcast. Some of the best online sports commentary you'll find anywhere on the interwebs over at The Athletic. And right now, through our partners at Detroit Sports Podcast, you can get a discounted subscription to The Athletic. Promo code DSP, D as in David, SP as in Paul, DSP. Promo code DSP at theathletic.com. Well, we mentioned earlier uh, in this week's episode that Selection Sunday isn't as far off as we think. It's, It's less than nine weeks away, and so it's time to start looking at some of the data out there about where teams stand in terms of the NCAA tournament. Now, I am a fan of uh, Ken Pomeroy's rankings. Uh, And the reason I like Ken Pomeroy's rankings is not because, as you can see, and we'll go through these numbers in a minute, they're more favorable to Michigan and the Big Ten, but because Pomeroy ranks his methodology off of how well you played. The RPI is strictly a ranking of whom you've played. The, the strength of your opponents, your opponent's opponents, their opponent's opponents, and so on down the line. That's a useful tool, but I don't think it, it, it puts everything in context. And so Ken Pomeroy's rankings are, I mean, hey, you played a great schedule, but if you didn't play good against that schedule, what's it matter? Hey, you may have played not that great of a schedule, but if you dominated teams, maybe that's something we need to take a look at. And so he's measuring efficiency offensively, defensively, how many points you give up per possession, how many points you score per possession. And so, I, you know, I really think both of them in, in many respects, if you put them together, give you a pretty good look at really how strong teams are. So so let's take a look at what the RPI thinks of the Big Ten heading into this week. This is where the RPI had the Big Ten coming into Sunday. 
All right, Purdue is the only top 10 team in the RPI. Ohio State, the only top, only other top 25 team. Sparty was 26, Michigan at 32, and that's, up, that's after being up several notches after winning in East Lansing. Maryland at 47, and those were the only Big Ten teams in the top 50. Nebraska, Minnesota, Northwestern, the only other Big Ten teams in the top 100 of the RPI. Here's why that matters before we get to Ken Pomeroy's rankings. The reason it matters is, one, the selection committee let it be known last year that even though Ken Palm's rankings are getting increasingly more popular, it is not a consideration for them. It is not a data point for them. When they meet in Indianapolis at uh, the beginning of March to determine who's going to get into the tournament, they just don't even look at that stuff. All right, so that's that's number one. And number two, that keeps the you know relevance upon the RPI. Well, if the RPI is primarily a schedule ranking uh, mechanism – if you're not playing a lot of teams that the RPI thinks have played strong schedules, it means you're not going to get a lot of credit for beating those clubs. So that is something to keep in mind. That's another reason why that win on the road against Michigan State was so huge for Michigan, because other than that, and then we've got a road game coming up here against Purdue in about a week or so, those are the only top 25 RPI opponents we're going to play on the road the rest of this season and the RPI also more heavily weights wins away from home all right you get more credit for those than beating good teams at home some of you may wonder hey we got two really good non-conference wins I mean these are two top 50 top 60 RPI teams in UCLA and Texas how come they didn't benefit Michigan more well Texas was on the road but UCLA was at home so that's something to keep in mind now when Ken Pomeroy looks at his methodology he's looking at not whom you've played but how well you have played in those games look at the difference in how he sizes up the big 10 he's got purdue number two in the country right now by the way vegas has purdue the favorite to win the ncaa tournament sparty at number six michigan number 17 so he's got michigan state 20 spots higher than the rpi he's got michigan what is that 18 spots higher than where they're at in the er did I do that math right? Four, no, 15 spots higher than where they're at in the RPI. Ohio State's similar. Maryland, somewhat similar. He's much higher on Penn State. He's got Penn State top 50 in the Ken Palm rankings. Even though Ken Pomeroy's rankings don't figure into who makes the tournament, typically if you're a top 50 team in Ken Palm's rankings, you make the NCAA tournament. But you can see Penn State doesn't even have a top 100 RPI, so they're not even on the NCAA tournament radar right now. Northwestern at 63, Minnesota 69, Wisconsin at 77, Nebraska 79. That's our opponent on Thursday night. Iowa at 86, Illinois 94. So look at the amount of teams Ken Pomeroy has in the top 100 of his rankings from the Big Ten that aren't even in the top 100 of the RPI. I I can't recall seeing a disconnect in a major conference like this between what the RPI says about it and what Pomeroy's rankings say about it. That is going to be something as we march closer to March. That will be something to keep an eye on when it comes to Michigan's not really a bubble team now. Now it's really about seeding, and that will definitely be a factor. And we're back here on Michigan Podcast with this week's Twitter poll. We asked you... This week, which Big Ten team from the East Division has the best shot to make the college football playoff this fall? 8% of you said Penn State. 8% of you said Sparty. 24% of you said Michigan. But the overwhelming choice is Ohio State. And if I had to vote, I'd have voted for Ohio State too. But I think more than 8% of people ought to be voting for Michigan State. I mean, you're talking 20 starters back. They get Michigan at home. They get Ohio State at home. I think we're not giving Sparty enough credit, and you know I hate saying that, but we do our best to tell it like it is here on Michigan Podcast, even if it's not how we'd like it to be. This week's question of the week comes from a lot of you asking, are you as sad about the passing of Keith Jackson as I am? Keith Jackson, whoa, Nelly. Keith Jackson was the narrator for many of the most memorable moments of my life, both the joy and the agony, whether it is Rocket Ismail returning two kickoffs for touchdowns, number one Notre Dame versus number two Michigan, or let's it go, caught by Westbrook. I'll never forget that, the agony of that. But then the joy, sitting in Rick O'Connor's basement with some high school buddies. Oh, look at this, one man to beat, goodbye, hello Heisman, Desmond Howard against Ohio State in 1991, my personal favorite. Keith Jackson moment, the end of the 98 Rose Bowl, sitting there with his longtime partner, Bob Greasy, as his son, Brian, 
leads Michigan to the national championship, and they're about to announce who the MVP of the Rose Bowl is. And he looks at Bob, would you like to know who it was? Because I'm standing here next to a proud papa. He tells him there live on the air that his son was the MVP of the Rose Bowl. It, Michigan football and Keith Jackson, this is the beauty of Keith Jackson. There's about 20 fan bases in college football that could reminisce like this, that think they had a unique tie between him and their team. He was the voice of college football. He gave the big house its name. And while I could sit here and attempt to wax poetic and put in perspective everything he meant for us as Michigan fans on those fall Saturdays, it's best just to let the voice of college football speak for himself. When the last glow drifts away from the big house at Michigan, it's a good time to have a seat and listen. Here, Yost, Kipke, Chrysler. And in your mind's eyes, see the lads who wore the colors. Harmon, who played both ways all the way to a Heisman Trophy and got a standing ovation once at the horseshoe. The Michigan football team is within sight of the summit of their mountain. Their journey inspiration in part from those who have climbed the world's highest mountain. But when you venture into the biggest house in football, you better come prepared lest ye perish at the hands of the big burly resident. For this is a house of history, a house of pride and tradition. Hail to the victor's valiant, hail to the conquering heroes. The touchdown, Wolverine! Touchdown, Michigan! Touchdown, Michigan. It's touchdown, Michigan. Hello again, everybody. I'm Keith Jackson. Working with us today is our commentator and analyst, Ara Parsigian. Now the Michigan Wolverines are assembled in the tunnel, and the crowd is coming to its feet. And when the Wolves come onto the field, you'll hear a roar that'll knock pine cones out of trees 50 miles away. Hello again, I'm Keith Jackson, and I think this game has everything. These teams represent two of the finest universities in the nation, backed by loyal legions, and I mean legions, millions of fans. For Bo Schimbeckler today, this will be his 200th game as a head coach at the college level. For Jerry Faust of Notre Dame, this will be his second game as a head college football coach. Just about as much drama packed into an afternoon of college football as you could possibly hope to have. The Michigan Wolverines not yet coming out of the locker room. It was 50 years ago in a football game between these two teams, which Michigan won 10 to 6, that a young man named Jerry Ford, Gerald Ford, played at center and played in that ball game. And handling the broadcast back to WHO in Des Moines for Iowa was a young man named Dutch Reagan, known as Dutch in those days seems incredible that it was 50 years ago that two men involved in this matchup between these two teams would eventually go on to become presidents of the United States. Now when a coach calls his team back from the lazy hazy days of summer, he usually has something in mind, a motivator. And when Bo Schimbeckler welcomed his Wolverines back for the fall practice, he reminded them in strident tones that they had finished with 10 wins and second in the national polls last year, but they had not won the conference championship, and by thunder, they would do that this year. That has been a constant theme for Michigan. And Bob Greasy, do we expect anything today other than a close, tough, knock them down belly-up football game? I think that's what you're going to see, and that's what you're going to get. Hello again, everybody. I'm Keith Jackson. This is one of those games that echo forever this is a game that reaches across generations that emphasizes the passion of partisanship this is a game where players make the big plays like 1993 when mercury hayes made this one for michigan that helped produce a wolverine win and took away the rose bowl from the buckeyes and last year when Tim Biaka Batuka carried 37 times for 314 yards and the Buckeyes' undefeated season was gone and so was the Rose Bowl. 
Hello again, everybody, and welcome. This is one of those games that matters mightily in college football, especially since it is on the second Saturday in November. And these are elements that will be impacted by what happens here today. They include the Big Ten Conference Championship, the Rose Bowl, a possible invitation to an Alliance Bowl, the National Championship, and the Heisman Trophy. Now, if that doesn't whet your appetite, you're watching the wrong channel. It has always been of paramount importance in Big Ten football to win the conference championship. Hello again, everybody. I'm Keith Jackson, and welcome to the Big House in Ann Arbor. If it is still so that a Big Ten football team wants that conference title more than any national championship, then we should have ourselves a cracking good game today in Ann Arbor. It was on a day like this, in a place like this, that I first met Walter Mitty, that purveyor of those golden moments that last a lifetime in the game of college football. Of course, it might last longer if it happened in a game between the Buckeyes and the Wolverines. You're in for quite a day, folks. The music, the sound, the ambiance of a college football game never more pronounced than here in this big, big old oval called Michigan Stadium in Ann Arbor. Greeting for the Wolverines at home. Kind of moment has to have deep roots, and it does. 117 years of growth, 764 wins, most by any Division 1A team. This is Michigan. and the blue skies of late September. Pretty good setting for what we're about to see. Carr said, and a good pooch punter, you wanted to be a bad kicker. Well, that's ugly. That'll work. And it's going right to the corner. Look at this. Out of bounds at the four-yard line. <laughs> oh, there'll be some ragged around the fireplace at Christmas. <laughs> Not quite. I don't think my, I could have handled that one. I don't think you could either. Clarence Williams' grandmother could have scored that one. Michigan showed you a little razzle-dazzle stuff. Four things that Charles Woodson can do. That thump you just heard, that was Bo Schembechler fainting. Bo <laughs> 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 But you know, Prater, and the last time Brian Greasy ran that far, his dad was chasing him with a stick. <laughs> with the oxygen. <laughs> Frank Beckman, who is the broadcaster for the Michigan team, came in for the game and said, what do you think? And I said what I thought. And now I've decided I don't know a damn thing about anything. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> the trophy presentation is coming up. The MVP in today's ball game. Ah, uh, you want to know who it is? I'm standing alongside his proud daddy, quarterback Brian Greasy of Michigan. <laughs> what a year he's had. Changed his whole life. <laughs> I don't blame you. You want to cry, you go ahead. I'll hold you up. That's Shea Greasy. You guys got me crying. <laughs> well, I'm kind of getting sick and tired of this. For every place we go, 
They take you down on the field and they're giving you rocking chairs from Penn State and honorary membership to the press box at Iowa. You got the best food in college football over there. Everywhere we go, they just high-fiving you and making the rest of us well, just fun. feel like we're carrying your bags, which we do. <laughs> well, if I could learn how to stay composed and but I can't because I love these people and uh, I've had nothing but fun. You've probably been here more than any other place in college football, haven't you? Yep, Over I the years? so. Yep. It's been great. This week's Marriott moment features the work of another great Michigan defense, 1993. They welcome Penn State to the Big Ten with an old-fashioned goal line stand into the third quarter. First and goal at the Michigan one. Two sneaks by Collins. Two slams by Carter. Nothing. And the Wolverines hold on for a 21-13 win in the first meeting between these two fabled universities. Tim Williams in the punt. Averaging just under 38 on 44 kicks this year. Nice high kick. Got a little wind under it. And it runs Howard back. Look at that. Oh, my goodness. One man. right now. Chinko is in there replacing Denson. And it is Dreisbach. Oh, yeah. He's got Williams wide open and he drops it softly into his hands and Clarence Williams will score. Touchdown, Wolverine. Our freshman Anthony Thomas comes in as the deep back replacing Chris Howard who may still be a little bit tender. Thomas gets the ball going outside. Got good speed. Head at the corner. Touchdown, Michigan. The ball is on the 37-yard line. It's second down and seven now. Greasy back to throw. Down the middle, wide open. It's Woodson. Touchdown, Michigan. Snap is low, but he gets it out all right. Oh, my goodness, look at this. <laughs> he runs Woodson all the way back to the 22-yard line. Woodson's got one block. Back goes Jackson. And he's got a problem. Still struggling. Now throws it in. It's accurate. It's right to Andre Butters. And Butters will score a touchdown. Oh, that could be a will breaker. 
Thomas is back in, the big back. Brian, play action, throws. He's got two of it open. Touchdown. Nine to nothing, Buckeye. And Greasy's first pass, drilled to Ty Street. He's wide open and gone for a touchdown. Give it to Perry. Up the middle he goes. To the outside. A foot race to the corner. Touchdown. I don't think you realize what an impact you've had on college football. You've been our greatest ambassador. And I just want to say for all of these people out here and all the people on ABC, we really appreciate all the things that you've done for college football and wish you the very best in your retirement. Nobody's had more.